Hey, Jimmy. Hey, I know you're shutting it up. We got some trash outside and the dog got in it. Would you help me get it? It's heavy. I can't. Hey, I didn't tell you to get that dog. I never did like them dogs. It's it's neighbor's dog. Well, we'll shoot that dog. I don't care about that dog. We shoot the neighbor's dog. I need a little help. I'm I'm studying. I'm studying. Every time I try to study, you come in here and bother me. Every time I'm doing something I want to do, you always bother me. I see you studying, but I need you to help. It won't take long. We'll do it together. I'll, 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 I'll do it after a while. When you find my remote that you lost... And the keys I never have misplaced. Remote. You always blame me for stuff that gets lost. I can't ever find it. I lay it in the same spot every time. time. It's the same spot. Listen, 99.9% .9 of the time when it's found, you did it. No, no I don't listen. believe that. Yeah, well, no, you don't. No. It's because you don't listen. You don't now, 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 woman, I, I don't want to argue with you no more. Did you call me woman? I called you woman. I, I'm not going to have that. How many times have I told you not to call me woman? That's disrespectful. Woman? Oh boy. I I'm not going to put up with it today. I've got to get ready. Wait a minute. Wait, wait. No, no, no. Get, get away from me. Oh, 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 oh. Now, that's what being a woman's all about. <laughs> I'd call law on you. That's that's abuse. That's wrong. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I hope that's not your home. Amen. I, I know that we're having to deal with different things at different times now. Oh, that comes a volume. But like I say, I hope that's not a picture of your home. I was praying this week. And I was thinking, what what can I do to, 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 to help people during this time? I mean, I, I, I want to preach and I want to be a help. And I was thinking, there's probably a lot of families that start to get on each other's nerves about now. Uh, that things have changed. There's probably fussing and fighting and fuming in some homes, and it shouldn't be that way. But the coronavirus... The stay-at-home executive order by the governor has fixed it to where many are stuck at home. This has changed your daily routine. The added stress, the financial burdens, the fact that the web page to sign up don't work and you can't call in and you've got the worry and the fear of the virus and the kids are home. On top of all that, you've got the kids at home and trying to feed them and take care of them and, and then you can't even find toilet paper or what you want from the store. <laughs> and it's just coming to a head and some of you are ready to explode if you haven't already. I want to help you. I want to give you some helpful hints for hurting families during this time. I, I told someone a while back, that this coronavirus, this stay-at-home executive order, could do one of two things. It will either be a baby boom in nine months, much like a winter storm comes in and, and, and everybody's snowed in for a couple of days, nine months later we usually have some babies born, being born. That could happen. And then I said that to someone and they said, yeah, or divorces. And I thought about that a lot this week and I thought this might be what your home needs what your family needs is time together to work on it to work together or it might be the nail in the coffin if you don't handle it right it's all up to you the atmosphere in your home it's up to you I can't control it no one outside your house can control it. Only you that live in that home control that atmosphere. If it's full of fussing and fighting like you've seen me and my wife pretend to do, because you know that, that we don't fuss like that. It's usually a lot bloodier. I mean, you know, knives, guns, you know, pitchforks, I mean, that kind of stuff. But, but if that's your home, that's your choice. That's what you've made it. You can have a home with love and peace. 
and find rest, a haven, heaven here on earth, or you can have fussing, fighting, and hell on earth is whatever you make it. Now, a few weeks back, I said there was some good going to come from this coronavirus. And one of the things that I pointed out that I said would be a good thing would be getting families together. I didn't put a lot of thought to how some families may fuss and fight and how some families would, uh, with the extra tension and stress, not be able to handle it and the anger and the worry wouldn't, wouldn't be able to handle it and would take it out on each other. But some are. I hope and pray that's not you. But this is a good time to work on your family and work on your marriage and work on your relationship. Now that you have time, you can work on it and strengthen the love and strengthen the relationship and strengthen the values and the morals and the standards in your home. Now is a good time to work on the spirituality of the home. But the devil is going to fight you. He would love to get into your home and cause fusses and disagreements and anger and bitterness and hurt feelings. That is what he lives for. He loves the chaos that comes with it because he wants to destroy the home. Why does the devil want to destroy the home? Well, because God ordained it. God blessed it. God loves it. And anything that God loves, anything that God has put, showed any attention to, the devil hates it and will fight against it. And he'll fight against your home as well. Some of you may be experiencing it right now. Maybe there's some of you, 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 you went to bed last night fussing and fighting. Maybe you got up this morning fussing and fighting. He's already got in there. Don't let him destroy your home. Maybe... Some of you know from experience his handiwork through failed relationships. I don't mean to bring up any past hurts, but I do want to help people now. Why does it matter? Why does it my home matter? What, what difference does it make how I live my life in my home? Is that not my business? Can I not have, do I not have the right to live any way I want to? Yes, you do. But you will pay for the car. You suffer the consequences and your children and maybe even their children because they're going to do what you do when they get older. The Bible says in Psalms 11 and verse 3, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? It said foundations, plural. We're just talking about one of the foundations. And one of the foundations that God ordained was the home. He ordained the home before the church. He blessed Adam and Eve's union before there ever was a church. He put his mark on it. Why is it so important? Why do preachers stress so much the marriage relationship, the marriage union, and doing it right? Because it's a picture of Christ in the church. God often uses a marriage relationship in the home, a godly home, to be a picture of the relationship we can have with our Savior, the church has with the Savior. Therefore, the devil wants to attack it. And he's doing a good job, I'm afraid. But if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? You have the power to do anything. You can fix it. You can make it right. You can get your heart right with God. You can get your home right with God. You say, but my husband won't, but my wife won't, but my children won't. You don't worry about them. You worry about you and let God take care of them. You just do right. And remember, as goes the home, so goes the nation. That's why it's so important. The strength of our country is not the government, it's not the White House, it's your house. The strength of our, com our country comes from the homes and the families that make up this country. Now, in this time that we have together, I want to help you. I could preach and spit and stomp and snort and tell you how wicked sin is. I could run up and down and, and point out how wrong it is that they're trying to uh, silence the church and leaving the liquor store and the abortion clinics open. But I choose rather to help you right now where you are if you're at home and you're having problems. 
I'm going to preach on helpful hints for hurting families. And I hope you pay attention and I hope that it will alleviate some stresses and some problems in your home. Remember this, sometimes the best way to move forward is to go back. You say, preacher, that don't make any sense. Well, it's one of those paradoxes. Sometimes the, the best way to go forward is to go back. And I'll give you an illustration. I used to work on cars. And I would go through the diagnostic test and the diagnostic pinpoint steps. And I would follow it all the way to the conclusion and still not know what's wrong with the car. It's one of those stumpers, one of them head scratchers. And like, what in the world? I've done everything. I've done everything right. Everything passes. It, nothing shows bad. What's wrong with this car? And you know what I found to be true most of the time? It's something I overlooked. It's something I neglected. It's something I didn't think was important. And I didn't spend no time looking at it. It's things that I overlooked most of the time. And the way I found them would be go back to the beginning. Go back to the basics and start over. That's what some of you need to do. You've been fussing, you've been fighting, you've been at each other's throats. Kids ain't been listening, they're having problems here. Stop! Just go back to the basics and start over. So, what I want to do is just give you a few things. I don't plan on being long, but that don't mean anything with me, I know. But I do want to give you a couple of things at least, and I'm going to spend a little time on this first one because it's important. First thing I want to help you with is communicating in the home, the communication in the home. People are stressed, worried, and even fearful or angered right now at what's going on in our country. Some want to get back to work. Some want to get back to church. Some are happy and loving it. They're doing fine the way it is. But most people want their lives back, want their routine back, and that stress and that anxiety is built up in them and they're on edge and anything will set them off. And they usually take it out on the ones they love. Not knowing how to communicate or improper communication can destroy a home. Let me give you something that may help you. I want to talk about communication for a little bit. And in order to communicate effectively, you're going to have to learn to talk to each other, not scream at each other, not holler over each other, not ignore each other, not give each other the silent treatment for two days, not storm off and slam the door, not get in the car and spin down the driveway. None of that, you're going to have to learn to work it out. That's communication. Learn to disagree without hating each other or getting angry at each other. Good communication will strengthen your marriage. It will strengthen your family. It will strengthen your home. One time a lady, she went to her pastor and she was, she was to the bullet point. This is it. I'm done. I'm not trying anymore. She said, Pastor, I want a divorce. And the pastor, he set up a meeting with her and he got in the room, he got in the office and he set her down and he says, Ma'am, I just want to know do you have grounds? And she said, yeah, we've got about three, three and a half acres. He said, no, 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 ma'am, do you have a grudge? She said, no, no, we have a carport. Ma'am, that's not what I'm talking about. Does your husband beat you up? No, I get up at 6.30 and he usually lays in bed till 7. Ma'am, you don't understand. I'm trying to see if you've got a case and she said that for a second. She said, no, I think it's a John Deere. He said, ma'am, are you having trouble? She says, yes. He says, well, what kind of trouble are you having? We just can't seem to communicate. And that's the way it is. We don't communicate enough to understand each other. How many times has your wife said, I told you yesterday? No, you didn't. Yes, I told you plainly yesterday. We were standing at the sink and I, and I said this or you was in there in the study and I said that. No, no, no you didn't. How many times have you told her? 
We talked about this last week. I said we was going to do this. How many times has that happened? No communication. Miscommunication. Communication is important. It'll save a lot of fussing and fighting. So I'm going to give you seven B's for communication. Seven B's for communication. And here's the first one. Be observant. Be observant. This will help you uh, communicate better with your wife or your husband or with your children. Be observant. You listen with your eyes as much as you do your ears. Learn to listen to them by looking at them and paying them attention. When they come in and tell you something and you're watching the ball game, you're not really listening. You're trying to hear the play by play. I'm going to say this, ladies, you can use some wisdom if you know he loves he loves football, and you come in there, and it's a tie score, and it's the last two minutes of the football game, and his team has the ball. Give him a little space. But, sir, I'll say this. Your wife should matter more than any stinking ball game. Amen, amen, amen. Now, learn to listen to each other by looking at each other and paying attention. If you have to, turn the TV off. If you have to, turn the radio off. If you have to, say, give me a minute, finish what you're doing, and then pay attention. Learn to listen to your spouse. Be observant. Secondly, be available. Be available. Don't keep putting off the important conversation. Honey, we need to talk. Well, not now. I'm busy. Well, hey, honey, come here a minute. I'm going to tell you something. Not now. Let me finish this. You just told them whatever you're doing is more important than whatever they want to discuss. Sometimes, let them tell you a little bit and then say, listen, we can have this conversation after a while. Let me finish this, but be agreeable to listen to them. And don't keep putting it off. If you keep putting it off, I promise you the devil will send somebody in that will listen to them. You keep ignoring your husband, and I promise you the devil will send some woman by that will say, I'll talk to you anytime you want to. You keep ignoring your wife, and I promise you there's some devil out there that will listen to her and enjoy listening to her. Be careful. Be observant. Be available. Here's another one. Be considerate. Don't interrupt. Remember how we were uh, play fighting over here a second ago and we was kind of talking over each other. Neither one of us was winning. Neither one of us was getting ahead. We was just getting angrier and madder and making the problem bigger and going to last longer and hurt more feelings and hurt more deeply because... We were just screaming over each other. Don't interrupt. Don't walk away and ignore them. Uh, be considerate. Here's something that's amazed me sometimes. I've talked to people and they say, you know, preacher, my husband is really nice to everybody else, but at home he's not so nice. Or my, 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 my wife's real good with other people's kids, but she has no patience for ours. Don't be like that. Be considerate of each other. Do something nice for each other once in a while. Do something nice for each other. Consider them. Do something that they like. One time a man was told to do something nice for his wife. And he thought about it for a while. They'd been married 10 years, had a couple kids, and bought them a house, was in debt, and they was struggling. And, and he thought, you know, it has been a long time since I've done something nice for her. So he said, I'm going to surprise her. He got off work early one Friday. Boss man let him off. He had snuck his best suit of clothes out and put them in the car before he left work that morning. He, he changed, had a suit and tie on. He went by the flower shop and got some flowers. He went by the candy store and had her some candy. And instead of coming in the back door and throwing stuff down and barking worse supper and fussing at the kids for, for being loud and rowdy, he rang the front doorbell. He was going to be standing there and surprise his wife. 
And she come to the door and she opened the door. And as soon as she opened the door, she just slammed it and hollered. Yeah, of all days to do this, you chose today. And he come in and said, what are you talking about? She said, the toilet's overflowing, the dishwasher just broke, little Johnny's puking, and your mama just called, they're coming for supper tonight, and you come home drunk? She thought something was wrong with him. She thought he was drinking and out of his mind because that wasn't his character. When you do something nice for him, let them know that's normal. That shouldn't be the abnormal. They shouldn't think you're drunk. You're doing, there's something wrong with you if you do something nice. Be considerate. Don't wait so long that they don't realize it's genuine. And don't always have a motive. Don't always do something nice because you're wanting to win the argument or do something nice because you're wanting to buy this or to go here or do that. Don't have ulterior motives in mind. Sometimes do something nice just because you come, just because you love them, just because you care for them, amen? Number four, be distributive. Uh, I mean, be, uh, I don't know the best way to put it. Demonstrate. Be distributive. But, uh, show, show them that you care. Like, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not a big hugger. I'm not one of these guys that just goes around hugging everybody. I like my space. I do. This is my space. Don't get in it. Amen? That's just my personality. But I still ask my wife for a hug. I still want her to know I care. I still, I still like a hug. I still want to give her a foot rub or a back rub or do something nice for her from time to time. Don't do it often enough, being honest with you. But she does things nice for me. She'll do things. She'll cook what I want. She'll fix what she thinks I like, she does things and asks for me. One time, an old farmer, he said, I told her I loved her when we got married, and I'll let her know if I ever change my mind. You know, that might work for the old farmer, but it ain't going to work on everybody. And you shouldn't make them that way. Amen. Uh, 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 demonstrate your love. Show them that they need that, that that you appreciate them. Demonstrate that you're listening. Demonstrate your affections rather than just say them. Rather than saying, you know I love you. You know I love you. You know I care for you. Do they? Have you ever showed it? Have you ever done anything to prove it? If you went to court, would there be enough evidence against you to prove it? You're guilty of loving them? That's something to think about, amen. One time Another old farmer, he was taken uh, to he was taken to a counselor. It was a secular counselor, and he was trying to help them with their marriage. And he was trying to encourage them to hang in there; they could work through it. And one of the problems was the old farmer just wasn't affectionate. He'd worked with pigs and cows and pushed them around all the time, and. He, he, he just kind of had the same attitude with his family. He'd push his kids around, his wife around. He just wasn't affectionate. He didn't demonstrate his love at all. And, and the counselor was trying to get through to him that women need hugs. Women need affection. Women need to see you care. And, and he couldn't get it through the farmer's head. He was having, now listen. She needs hugs. She needs kisses. She needs this a couple times a week, not just once a month or once a year. She needs this. Women thrive on this. The old farmer just sitting there. And finally, the counselor got fed up. He couldn't take it anymore. He just stood up. He took the farmer's wife and he laid her back and just kissed her right in the mouth and then stood her up. She's just standing there just dazed, just, just dazed. And he looked at the old farmer and he said, now she needs that. Two times a week. Old farmer sit there and he pushed his hat back and he thought for a minute. He said, I'll bring her every Tuesday and Thursday. <laughs> every Tuesday and Thursday. You can't put it off on someone else. I promise you, if you don't show her the love and affection she craves, if you don't give him the love and affection he craves, the devil puts somebody there at will. Amen. Demonstrate it. Be dis. All right, number five, be wise. Be wise. Uh, bring, bringing up past problems is not wise. Bringing up past problems right when they come home from work is not the best timing. It's not wise. When you know they're having a bad day, 
That's not when you want to win your arguments. That's not when you want to bring up the fusses. Bringing up the past will not fix the problem. One time two men, they were pumping gas, and they hadn't seen each other in a while, and they said, oh, hey, is that you? Yeah, hey, man, how's it been? And they just start talking, how's the family? How's the kids? And before they knew it, hours had passed by. Neither had called home to let their wives know. They agreed to meet up the next day and they, when they realized how late it was and they went home. Well, the next day they met up and one of them was standing there just shaking his head. He said, how did it go to your house? It didn't go too good to mine. She was upset that I was so late getting back. What about yours? He said, yeah, my wife, she got plum historical. He said, you mean hysterical? He said, no, historical. She told me everything I ever did wrong all the way back when we first met. It all came out last night. He, Don't do that. If you fought the fight in the past and it's been settled, leave it in the past. Don't take it and throw it on the fire now just to keep the flame going. Amen? Get over it. If it's in the past, it's done been fought over, it's done been dealt with, leave it there. Deal with the problem at hand. Deal with the problem at hand and it may help you more than you'll ever know. Learn to attack the problem, not each other. That's the problem a lot of times. Rather than addressing the real issue, the real problem, you just attack each other. In my house, my girls grew up in the house. They didn't hear mom and dad fussing. They didn't hear mom and dad cussing each other. We didn't have that in our home. I did not want that in our home because I grew up in a home like that and I didn't want that in my home. I wanted better for my girls. Number six, be an example. The way you listen will come back to you. You ignore him, she'll ignore you. You continue to degrade her, she's going to degrade you. You don't show any attention to her, one day she's not going to have any attention for you. You put your friends and their wants above hers, she's going to start putting her friends and their wants above yours. You reap what you sow. If you speak roughly, guess how they're going to talk back. The Bible says a soft answer turneth away wrath. If they're angry and they say something, don't lose your temper. Don't lose your cool. A soft answer turneth away wrath. You can calm it down or you can make it worse. Be an example. Here and be courageous. The main reason that a lot of people don't communicate is fear. Fear of being vulnerable. Fear of what someone, what their spouse will think of them. Fear. Now listen, you ought to get back to like it was when you first got married. When you were dating, you would call each other on the phone and talk to each other for hours. You would sit somewhere in a park or sit somewhere on the front porch, mom or dad's or somebody's house, and you would talk for hours and couldn't get enough of it. Now you don't even want to talk. God's given you some time. Maybe some of the good that's coming out of this, I don't like it. I'm not, I'm not saying it's a good thing, but there can some good come from this coronavirus. This might be healing for your home. This might be an opportunity for you to see the needs and fix them. That might be what this is about. That's communication in the home. That's the seven B's. Now, Number two in your outline, we talked about the communication in the home. How about the commitment in the home? Commitment in the home. Yeah, it sounds simple, but, but boy, there's no commitment anymore. Today, just look around. The old timers, they used to stick it out, man. They would fuss it out and they stayed married. They were married 50 and 60 years before one of them passed on. The Lord called them home. They stuck it out. But nowadays, as soon as it don't go your way, as soon as you don't get what you want, as soon as you feel disrespected, you're ready to throw in the towel. I quit. I'm going home. I'm going back to mama. Here's the problem with that. When there's no commitment... There seems to be no value. If you don't care enough to fight for your marriage, you should have never gotten married to start with. 
You should commit it. And they have no confidence in the fact that you will stick it out. When you tell them, say, listen, as long as you don't cheat on me, we'll fuss it out, fight it out, we'll work it out. I'm not going anywhere. That gives them confidence. That gives them assurance. They know where the line is, amen? They know they can't cross this line or, or that's it. But other than, other than biblical grounds, adultery, fight it out. Work it out, amen? Now, I know there's things that you shouldn't put up with and you shouldn't put up with a, a wife that beats you with a pot. Nobody should have to put up with that. Am I the only one? Amen. <laughs> but no one should have to put up with abusive stuff like that. I understand that. But at the same time, short of something drastic, work it out. So many times they're fussing over silly stuff and it just builds up and it turns into explosions and they run home to mama and it's all done and it's over with. Every time you get mad, you say, I'm leaving. Well, you'd say it to hurt them. But one of these days, they've heard it so many times, they're going to say, I'll hold the door. Go. Then what you're going to do? Don't quit. Be committed. Then you have communion. Now again, spend some time together. When you were first dating, you couldn't, have, you couldn't spend enough time with him. You couldn't be around him enough. You couldn't, there weren't enough hours in the day. You wanted to be with them every waking moment. Now they have to make an appointment to see you. That's terrible. That's terrible. Your girlfriends and them wanting to hang out at some slumber party or some uh, uh, Tupperware party or some jewelry party is not more important than your husband wanting to spend time with you. You put your friends before him. It's not right. You know what's going to happen? One of these days, he's going to put his friends before you. I was talking to a couple one time. I was counseling. This was many years ago at another church. I was counseling. And the guy was a mason. And he wanted me to know he was a mason. He was proud of the fact that he had joined the Masonic Lodge and he was a third degree mason. He wanted me to know that right up front in the meeting. I'm a mason. I don't, I, I don't really need this. I'm coming here trying to save my marriage. And I told him it was a good thing. There wasn't nothing wrong with counseling. There's wisdom in counsel. There's nothing wrong with seeking counsel from time to time. Everybody needs counsel from time to time. And if you say you don't, you do, and you'll learn. But anyway, in that, in that the, the whole problem was when they dated, he had all the time in the world for his girlfriend. But once they got married and they started working, and children come in the scene. He started hanging out with some guys that wound up down at the Masonic Lodge and he joined the lodge all his free time rather than being with his wife and his children was now with his newfound buddies at the Masonic Lodge. And all she was asking was for some time to see her husband and he was unwilling to give it. He was more proud of the Masons and his buddies in the name that he would have in the community than he was his wife and her needs and his family and their concerns. I told him this. I said, do you think your wife married you just so she could wash your underwear, cook your supper, clean the dishes, and you'll clean your house and kiss you goodbye uh, when you go to work and then wait on you to come kiss you goodnight when you go to bed? No, she married you because she wants to spend time with you and she should come before any of those men down there. Which one of them's kissing you? Which one of them's washing your dirty underwear? Which one of them's doing for you what she's doing? Or which one of them are doing for you what he's doing if you're the lady and you're spending all your time with your lady friends? Or maybe it's mama. And sometimes for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother. Amen. There's times you can spend too much time over at mom's and neglect your home. Too much time with dad and neglect your home. Nothing wrong with seeing mom and dad. Nothing wrong with spending time with mom and dad. But if it is affecting your marriage, if it's affecting the relationship, it's time you put the relationship first where it should be. Communion. Spend some time together. Now you can walk and you can spend some time together. You can find things that you like. Amen. Here's another compromise. Boy, I hate even saying that. I just don't. 
That, that don't even feel right in your mouth. I, it almost feels like a cuss word to me. It's a filthy, foul word, compromise. I, man, no way an independent Baptist is going to compromise. Amen, amen, amen. And in a religious sense, in the spiritual sense, compromising with this world, compromising with sin, compromising with the devil is wicked and it's wrong. But I'm telling you, it's the secret to successful marriages. You have to sometimes compromise with each other. Sometimes what you have for supper is what she wants. Sometimes where you go out is where he wants. Sometimes it's where she wants. Sometimes you have to learn to work together. Amen? Compromise. Compromise. Four. Or, uh, well, I got one, two, three, four. Four is compromise. Five is coping. Learn to cope with problems. Don't always push them off and all that stuff. I ain't even going to go there. I'm out, of, I'm out of time, but I'm going to say this last one, compassion. What happened to putting each other first? What happened and made it all about me and my wants? When did it change from when you were dating? What happened? Life happens, don't it? I didn't expect this. That's life. Learn to deal with it and show compassion along the way. Show your spouse that you care, not just in word, but in action. Show them that you care. Let me read you a verse here in, Psalm, in Romans 12. In Romans 12, verse 18, uh, here's the challenge for the week. I'm, I've only got one message this week. And this one I thought was so important. I didn't want to give you so much to work on. I want you to work on your home, work on your marriage, work on your relationship with your children, with your wife, with your husband. Work on the dynamics of your home. Make sure that it is pleasing not only for yourself, a home with peace and joy and happiness, but it's a home that's pleasing to the Lord. Let me share this verse with you. Romans 12 and verse 18. If it be possible... As much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. Father, I pray that you would just bless this message. Father, I hope and pray that, that, that there's very few that's fussing and fighting. But Lord, I fear there's probably more than just a few. There's probably quite many, many across this nation. And Father, I pray that you would uh, help this message to find its way in their home, and not just in their home, but a lodging place in their hearts. And Father, help them take it and apply it and put it to work. And Father, I pray your blessings on it. Lord, it's not my wisdom. It's not what I've said. It's your word, Lord. These are principles drawn from studying your word, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that men would love their wives as Christ loved the church and be willing to die for them. I pray that women would, Lord, accept their role as the helpmate. I pray, Lord, that the children would find their place and be obedient to the parents. And, Lord, that the morals and standards in every home would be pleasing to you. Lord, we would have a stronger nation, a stronger church. We would be a better people for it. And, Lord, that's what I ask. And I pray, Lord, that you give them the wisdom to do just that. And Father, if there's any lost, I pray, Lord, that you would help them see their need of a Savior and help them call on Jesus and ask them to save them today. In Jesus' name, amen.